A key aspect to the Christian experience is reading our Bible, which is why we do the midweek move. We study the scriptures line by line, verse by verse, asking ourselves what's happening here. But there's an interesting question that people have been asking lately, and that's this is, what Bible should we be reading? And today on the midweek move, we're going to talk about that a little bit. Hello and welcome to the Midweek Move podcast extension of the Healing Place, the podcast where we examine scriptures line by line, verse by verse, and ask ourselves, what is happening here today, ladies and gentlemen? It's kind of a, a, it's a solo episode that is kind of a, a placeholder, if you will. I am very excited about what's coming up over the next several weeks here on the Midweek Move. Uh, we're going to make a, a, a kind of a summer series we call the Weekly Shorts, and these are going to be shorter episodes, but I'm excited about why they're going to be shorter. They're shorter because we're bringing in various guests who aren't used to this kind of thing. They're not necessarily preachers and stuff like that, but they're various people that are, um, how do I put this? Uh, they come from all ages and backgrounds, and um, they're just normal people. We talk about often how these Bible studies, they're meant to be casual conversations between two people. We sometimes make a big ordeal out of studying the Bible than we probably should. And people have developed this idea that, well, I have to be a, a, a scholar, I have to be this or that, and you don't have to. And we'd really try hard to make sure that these conversations are pretty, uh, how do I put this uh, appropriately? that they are applicable for every person, to the average layman who's new to the scriptures, who doesn't even know how to read their Bible, and to the person who's a high-end scholar who's been doing this for, for forever. And one of the things that we're doing over the next several weeks for these weekly shorts is we're going to have people with different age groups, different backgrounds, so you're going to be part of it. And there's shorter conversations, kind of bite-sized things. We have a lot of young adults. I'm uh, working on having several teenagers, actually, from our youth ministry, who are going to be up here, and we're just going to talk about the scriptures together. We're going to be continuing our journey through the book of Luke, but they're going to be a little bit shorter, bite-sized conversations for you guys over the next several weeks. But going into I didn't want to just do a, a little pause video <laughs> and go, all right, see you guys next week. I wanted to give you guys some value. And um, recently, there is a meme that has been circulating on the internet for quite a while. Uh, and it, it comes back in, in waves. And it's this interesting meme that somebody created that's comparing the King James to NIV. And the implication they're trying to make is that there's some sort of nefarious things taking place with the NIV in modern translations, suggesting that they're removing things out of the Bible? And uh, the short answer is no. No, they're not. Um, and I could go deeper into that conversation, but so many other people have done a better job of doing that. And in fact, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to put a link in the description of this video and a timestamp for you guys to go to uh, where a, a, a friend of ours, Pastor Paul Burke, uh, he was another minister in Louisiana, did a great job of actually responding to this meme in an appropriate manner. It wasn't just attacking the meme, and it was not, I want to put this out there, he was not attacking the NIV, but he was explaining where Bible translations come from and explains a little bit of what this meme is miscommunicating. And uh, I love Paul, he did a great job. And what's interesting, and this again, this is the problem with the internet, is things are forever. Uh, this meme circulated three years ago, and Paul handled this three years ago, and he did a great job. So I'm going to put a link for you guys to go check that out. But what I want to talk about is what Bible translations do I use? What translations uh, are, are good that are out there and how Bible translations kind of work? Because there is some confusion. There's some people out there that have this mindset that it's, every translation is just drastically different. And then there's just different information, every single one. And hey, which one can you trust? And short answer is this. You could probably trust most of them. When people ask me, Dallas, what Bible should I get? What Bible do I need? I ask them, which one are you actually going to read? That is, right off the bat, which one will you actually read? If it's King James, rock it out. Read that King James. If it's New King James, read it. If it's the English Standard Version, read that. Now, there are a few things I would say, okay, this isn't actually a Bible translation. We're going to get into that. And there are a few things I will say, this is not good for you to use at all under any circumstance, and you should avoid it. And we'll mention a couple of those later in the video also. But you guys need to understand that when it comes to Bible translations, we are uh, we are reading scriptures that were given to us by God, yes, but they were written originally in Hebrew, in Greek. And so they're not English. 
and those the rules for those languages are different than the rules in English. And in fact, there are words that just don't make sense in English. Not just to, not just that, but there are vocabulary, there's phraseology that don't mean the same thing today as they did back then. And so when Bible translators are working through this, they have to sift through all this data to try to make it something that you, as a modern reader, could read and understand. When I teach about this, and I've taught about this several times over the years here at The Healing Place, uh, we used to do a class called Biblical Literacy Training, which was kind of honestly a a precursor to the midweek move. (laughs) But I, I broke down Bible translations and how it works out. And when I teach about Bible translations, how the Bible is translated, the conversation about language, this is the illustration I use every single time because it's perfect in my opinion. <laughs> um, my favorite fast food taco joint uh, is Taco Bueno. It is one of my favorites, a place that we, it's mostly in Texas. We had one for a short while here in, in Shreveport and unfortunately it closed down, but Taco Bueno I, I love you guys. I have a lot of nostalgia uh, memories and love for eating Taco Bueno. Uh, the Bob, that is the that is the best thing to get on the menu, hands down. <laughs> but Taco Bueno, that's an interesting title, isn't it? Taco Bueno, what does that mean? Well, in Spanish, Taco Bueno, uh, if you were to literally translate it word for word, means taco good, which sounds like a caveman, which honestly, sometimes when I'm eating Taco Bueno, that's how I feel. I'm just like, mm, taco good. I'm just shoveling back party tacos all day long. <laughs> but it's not, it doesn't make sense in English, does it? Taco bueno. But structurally, in Spanish, if you're a Spanish speaker, that's not what you would say. It makes sense to say taco bueno. But in English, if I were to translate it into something that made sense, that was applicable for English listeners to understand what is happening here, I would say good taco. That's how grammatically we would say that, good taco taco. So in, Sp- or in Spanish and English, again, all kinds of rules. What's well, the same thing with Hebrew and Greek? Things don't translate correctly. So when a translator is coming at it and they're trying to translate the scriptures, they have to go, okay, this is the grammatical structure, but it doesn't work in English. So they have to rearrange words. They have to figure out how things work out. At the same time, vocabulary changes. Things don't mean the same thing as they used to. There are colloquialisms Keep that in mind. There are, just like in today's language, we have colloquialisms that we use here. They had those back then. We didn't invent those in English. (laughs) Those were things that were established all the time. And there are colloquialisms. There are things and ideas that are said in the Old Testament and in the New Testament that uh, they're hard for us to understand today. Look at our own colloquialisms that we have here today in modern, modern English speech. I'm a elder millennial, if you will, a zennial, uh, one of those bridgers from between Gen X and, and millennials. And we had our own vocabulary system. If we said, man, something is tight, that meant it was cool. It was neat. If I say something was tight to an older person that's older than me, they'd be like, oh, well, you need some WD-40 to loosen that up. <laughs> but even the younger generation, I say something's tight, they're like, I don't under, what does that mean? What is this phraseology that you're that you're saying. Gen, uh, Gen Z, Gen Zers, they have a tendency to say things like, oh man, like you ask them to do something, they're like, ah, bet. What does that mean? What does bet mean? Well, me- bet means, yeah, okay, I got it. I'll handle this. I'm on my way to handle this right, right now. Doesn't mean anything to a lot of older millennials and certainly the, the Gen Xers and the boomers, but that's a colloquialism that they developed. And Gen Alpha, they themselves are developing their own colloquialism. They're saying their own vocabulary that means all kinds of things. And it's confusing a lot of folks. Why? Because that's what happens with language. So back to our scriptures, back to the Old Testament and New Testament. What happens? Well, again, these are things that are, that are written, and there's colloquialisms that made sense in the time period that don't quite make sense today. So our translators... They're also having to figure out how to say some things. Now, I'm not saying they're using slang, but that, I, that's kind of an extreme example I've been using, obviously. But they're having to translate those into a fashion that makes sense for the modern readers. And the fact of the matter is, even as they work to make that happen, in 1611, when the, the writers of, of the King James were writing their stuff out, they only had so many resources. They didn't fully understand everything 
that they were reading. In fact, in the preface to the King James, they say, hey, look, we've done the best we can, and we hope that future generations do do better in helping to understand what God has given us through these Hebrew and Greek texts. And so, but again, some of the stuff that they put in there, they don't quite mean the same thing as they do today. There's a whole video series out there um, uh, done by a, a really uh, solid uh, YouTuber, and he talks about these false friends, about these phraseologies that they were said in the King James that don't make sense today. Um, and he, he walks you through these things. His name is uh, Mark Ward. That's his name. <laughs> And it's a, it's a really great series that he walks through people with about, okay, King James, all right, good. Again, nobody here is saying King James is a bad Bible. Don't say that. But there are words that they don't mean the same things today as they did in 1611 when it was originally written. So now you guys have an understanding of how this works. You have to, the, the challenges that translators have to work with, they have to work through the idea of vocabulary, grammatical things, colloquialisms, and things that make sense today. We have to work through words, even in English, that don't mean the same thing in, from place to place. All that has to come together to create our Bibles that we use. And over the years, we've had various people who come down and they translate it. But when you translate it, you have different schools of thoughts. You have different ideas of how to do this. And so how, like what's the process? How do you make this happen? Uh, Logos.com is a fantastic software uh, I, <laughs> it is it is a top tier software, guys, for Bible study. And uh, honestly, I, I hope to get my hands on it one day because it is absolutely amazing. But they put out a great article about Bible translations, about what it is and the history of translations. But they have this great breakdown of of certain things, of the transcripts and how everything was out. And they uh, they separate the translations into these kind of categories: formal translations, moderate translations, and then uh, functional translations, and then paraphrases. This is the breakdown that they have. And I'll try to have some of these images up on the screen for you guys to look at. And I'll also have a link in the description down below for you guys to check out um, these uh, this article itself directly out on their website. But the formal translation, these are the, where they try to do word for word as best as they can. That was the plan. That was the idea behind creating these these Bible translations. And this is a fantastic way of translating things, but it becomes wooden for people. It's hard to understand. Again, go back to our example, taco bueno, taco good. It's, it's awkward, doesn't quite work right, but it gets you there, right? Again, I, I, I use a lot of the translations that are in this. Right here is a, is a Bible that was given to me at my ordination a few weeks ago back. It's the English Standard Version. This is one of those formal translation formal uh, translations that they have out there. They have uh, the ESV, the New King James is part of that formal uh, translation. The King James Bible, the New American Standard Bible. These are all examples of of Bible translations that fit this mold. They fit within this world of word for word formal equivalence translations. Uh, there are others out there that are, are really good. Um, and then you have others, though. I've kind of moved down here. We have this what's called moderate translations. These are the ones that they try to find a, a blend between formal and functional translation. They try to put those together. And this is where you have things like the NIV or the Contemporary Standard Bible. These are your moderate they're trying to blend the two of, of, of functionality and also uh, word for word. And again, both th these are fine translations. They are fantastic translations. I, when I first got saved, used an NIV Bible all the time. And uh, it was, a, in fact, it was a, it was a yellow uh, Bible that came from an event with uh, the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And I used the mess out of that Bible uh, it was held together literally by duct tape and prayer <laughs> because I, I I literally, so many notes were written in it and all sorts of stuff. In fact, I, I kind of miss it. Uh, I, I lost that Bible years ago. Uh, I was uh, at, a, at a, a, a church in Ennis, Texas, actually. And uh, my friends and I, we had uh, something come up. There was an emergency. We had to leave quickly. Left my Bible. Never saw it again. So whoever found that duct tape Bible, I hope my notes have blessed you <laughs> over the years. Oh, my goodness. But NIV, again, CSB, the Christian Standard Bible, fantastic. And, again, they do a great job of blending 
that word for word, but also that thought for thought. That let's kind of make this make sense for us translation. Which brings us to our functional translations. Now, these functional translations, they work to choose renderings that are uh, achieve the same function for today. They make they make sense. They so this will go be instead of saying good taco or for, instead of saying taco good, good taco. Right. This is what that is, and these are your uh, New Living translation. That's a fantastic uh, one. Also, we Pastor likes to use the New Living again. It's more of that thought for thought, but it gets the idea in a, in a very appropriate manner because some people it's it's not always uh, appropriate. <laughs> um, the New Living. Uh, now, there's some debate about how functional it is. Some people will put the NIV more in this thought process also. Honest NIV and LT, they're pretty similar. I do feel like the NIV is a little bit more towards a word for word at times, but they're both fantastic Bibles that work well. But then you get into what we call paraphrases. Now, these are where you take the thoughts. It's not just a matter of a thought for thought or a word for word and make things work. They're paraphrasing. They're retelling What's actually happening in these scriptures? And and this is a this is the thing. This is not bad, but it's not good. All right. I when I when I talk to people, when we talk about Bible translations and what they should and shouldn't use, I would say, look, these paraphrases, consider them to be tools. They're like commentaries. They help you to understand, but they're not the word of God. They're not direct translations of the word of God. But they are somebody goes okay. I've they've they've digested what's been said. Okay, let me paraphrase this. Try to help you to understand what's happening. And sometimes things are shorter. Sometimes they are longer. So go back to our example of taco bueno again. Taco bueno. The thought for, the word for word would be taco good. The word for the thought for thought would be good taco. The paraphrase of that is the uh, the Latin based food that uses meat and cheese and tortillas is a very scrumptious desi- uh, item to eat just about any day of the week, even uh, outside of Tuesday. That is the long <laughs> paraphrase of it. Doesn't say taco bueno, but it says taco bueno. Does that make sense? And in this, you'll find things like the Living Bible or the Message Bible. These are paraphrases. These are not, I repeat, not actual Bibles. Are they bad? No. Are they good tools for helping you kind of understand things a little better? Sure, absolutely. But they're not actual Bibles. If you're planning to get into the Word of God and to study the Word of God, you need an actual Bible. And uh, I highly recommend for just uh, for people who are who are getting into the Word of God, again, pick a translation that you're actually going to read. That's what it boils down to. We need to read the Word of God. We need to read the Scriptures. We need to be in this on a regular basis because this is God's revelation to us. There's a phrase I heard I don't know, it's stuck with me forever, and I love it. People are looking for a fresh revelation, a fresh word, but they haven't ever processed this one right here. And so you need to get into this. And whether that's you reading the NIV, the NLT, the KJV, the English Standard Version, whatever it is, pick the one that you will read and understand and grow from it. It's great. It's awesome. Now, are there differences? Yes, there are some minor differences. And I'm going to emphasize the word minor. But Dallas, what about all these things that like these memes that say there's whole verses taken out? Okay, well, that's a whole other conversation. And we talk about that often on the midweek move as we dissect this line by line, verse by verse. We deal with these, what we call variant texts. And we point out the fact that, you know, the King James writers, they had some great resources, but they didn't have everything. And they had some stuff that wasn't quite accurate at times. But the things that they had that was added into the scriptures, because that's the stance that that, uh, I take and many of us do take, it doesn't change our doctrine. Nothing has changed when we look at the most accurate scriptures. It's just not. All doctrines of the church are affirmed throughout every one of these translations, period, in a discussion. There's no argumentation there. Now, again, if you're a King James person, if you're a King James preferred Rock it out. Have fun. King James is great at times. There are some things I have in my head that I've memorized that are King James, period. <laughs> they always are and always will be. But there are things I memorize that are NIV, they're NLT, they're English Standard Version. 
and they're all solid translations that are great and they are good for the edification of the body, for teaching, for rebuke, for all the above. That They are all great translations. Now, I said at the beginning, there are some translations that I'm like, you definitely need to stay away from. And I'm not talking about the paraphrases, okay? Again, paraphrases are not Bibles, but they're great tools. I would put them as a, another resource along with this. This is one of my many commentaries that I use on a regular basis. Uh, this is the Expositor's co- Bible Commentary. This is not the Bible. This is some very well-educated individuals who have studied the Word of God. They have studied context. They have studied history and all kinds of things. They have studied the Greek and the Hebrew, and they go, okay, this is how this breaks down. This is the meaning we have here. This links back to this. That's what this is. I would put the Message Bible and then the Living Bible as tools that you could use along with your commentary. But this and those Bibles do not supersede this, an actual translation of the Word of God. But there are a few things that are out there that are not good. Uh, one uh, popular one that's made some circles that um, we, we kind of have a policy at the Midweek Move that we don't use, and that is the Passion Translation. It's um, it's There's a lot of issues with that. Uh, it's Simply put, really isn't much of a translation, and there's a lot of things in there that are, are wrong, flat out, uh, biblically. And if you want more information on that, I want to encourage you guys to check out um, Mike Ward. He's done a fantastic job of breaking down all of those conversations. Not Mike Ward. Uh, <laughs> that was, I'm putting together somebody else's name. Um, check out. I'm pulling him up uh, right now on my thing. That's it. Mike Winger. Check out Mike Winger. <laughs> He did a whole series on the Passion Translation. It was really well done, well put together. And uh, what I appreciate about about Mike and Mark both is they are they come with their positions respectfully and with gentleness, and they're they're genuinely trying to walk us through the situation, help us understand things. Uh, but that said, the Passion Translation is not a good translation. Period. Another one that we don't recommend at all because it's not a Bible that should be used is the New World Translation. There are some fundamental issues with that that are mistranslated for their organization. And that's something that you should probably stay away from. Uh, Other than that, like I said, most of the Bibles out there, most of them, again, there's a few others that are probably that I'm missing, that I'm not thinking of right now that you should be cognitive of. They're fine, guys. They're perfectly fine for you to use to grow and learn. And honestly, over the years, you may find that, you know, you lean one way with one Bible and then you find yourself really getting into another Bible for a long time. I use the New American Standard Bible exclusively. And I still use it on a regular basis. For a long time, I used nothing but the New King James. I have a New King James study Bible at the house that is tore up, held together by tape. And um, it's it's a great study Bible. And... Um, I, I love it, <laughs> but right now, again, simply because it's my newest Bible I just got, I'm using this quite a bit, the single standard version. You'll go through seasons where you like that and that's okay. I recommend guys using Muzzle translations. The U version Bible app is a fantastic tool because lets you do that. Biblegateway.com allows you to have multiple translations on one page. Fantastic tool. And you can go out and buy a physical Bible that has multiple translations on it. Uh, I was talking with our producer, Rick Humphreys, the other day, and Rick was telling me how he actually used to do that for a long time. He had a Bible. I think it had the King James, the New American Standard, and the NIV. Uh, so you had a a um, thought, our word-for-word equivalent, King James, that was based off of the, uh, I believe, the Byzantine text, uh, the TR, if you will, the Texas Receptus. And then you had the NASB, the New American Standard, which was based off Alexandrian text and other things, had uh, older, more reliable scriptures uh, or things. And it was a word for word. And then you had the NIV, which, like we said, was more of a thought for thought translation. I think now he's using the NLT, the New Living, on a regular basis. He really likes that. And um, it's all great, it's good stuff. <laughs> I hope this didn't come off as too much of a rant for you guys. This was a a genuine desire. Again, the goal here is to help you guys to understand what you're reading, to help you understand in context your Bible. And some of you guys, you're looking at your Bible, you're like, man, I, I have this. And, um, and, and you've been seeing these memes on the internet and you've been questioning things. Just ignore them, guys. I promise you, they're not going to help you. They're not helping anybody. 
If you have a King James Bible, bless you, use it. It's a good translation. And uh, I'm telling you, it's it's gotten a lot of people through a lot of stuff. Um, why is there all this argumentation over it? Honestly, some of it comes from a very pure and gentle place. And, and that is that people, good, faithful Christians, who um, there was a time when many believers struggled with their faith and there was actual persecution in our country. I know that's hard to believe, but there was actual persecution. And the Bible that they had was all that they had to get them through. And the verses they memorized were found in those translations. And so there's an emotional attachment to it. There's a uh, beautiful, blessed saint that I know that she used to have to hide under her bed at night to read her Bible because if her father caught her doing it, she'd be in trouble. And the translation she read out of got her through. And so there's an emotional attachment to it, and that's okay. It's fine. It's gotten you through. I remember years ago when, when I taught this whole subject once before, I had a person kind of have a, 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 a um, they were distraught because I said that, you know, the translation's fine, but it's not the best. And they're like, well, but what about this? Well, it's fine. It's good. Use that Bible. It's still good. It's still the word of God. There's still, again, the differences between the things that are based off the Texas Receptus and the, and the Alexandrian text, they are minimum, guys. They are so, like, again, everything is confirmed throughout all these translations. Your faith is not going to be shaken or rattled if you're actually reading your Bible in full in context. So I feel like I'm getting a little too far from conversation now. Bottom line, grab a Bible that you're going to read. Grab a Bible that you'll be willing to pick up on a regular basis and actually read and walk through it. Are there great tools? Yes, absolutely. And if you guys want, we can do a, a video like this later about the various study tools that myself, that I use, that Pastor Scott uses and others use that are helpful. But read your Bible and grow. And next week, guys, I'm again, I'm super excited. We just the start of the weekly shorts. And we're gonna have various people, young people, much younger people who are gonna be part lending their voice, talking through things in a very real and very casual way as they discover the scriptures together using, honestly, various translations. <laughs> Until next time, guys, have a great week. Mm-hmm.